Welcome once again, and I'd like to invite you to kneel with me as we seek God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we open your holy word, we pray that we may understand more about our times, and that as we do, that we will discern your plan for our lives in these last days. Send your Holy Spirit today, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Today I'm going to talk to you about the secret aims of globalization. Globalization is uh, being brought into this world little by little, day by day, step by step. And uh, we find in the Bible a clear understanding of the principles of globalization. Now I'd like for you to turn with me in your uh, Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. And before we begin with Daniel chapter 1, I'd like to just review what we've learned about globalization. There are several main concerns about globalization. First of all, they want to establish cities in order to control the masses. Cities control everything about, uh, about their citizens. Secondly, globalists are concerned about establishing a common language because they want to be sure that they have a way to accelerate the process of globalization, which is ultimately a rebellion against God and His plan, God's principles. Thirdly, globalization's concerns, uh, concerned, uh, is concerned about security. Um, they're obsessed with security. And there's cameras everywhere, there's, there's airport security, we have security of banks, we have security of, of, um, of, of every aspect of society, including right down to our own homes. So globalization is very concerned about national security, about uh, security against terrorism, uh, security against every form of threat that might come to a city or a nation. And number four, they're concerned about climate change. Climate change is a, um, an issue that was clearly seen at the time of um, Nimrod's Tower of Babel, but in the last days we see it once again. So those are the four primary concerns of globalists. They want cities, common language, security, and of course protection from climate change. Now let us study another example of globalization and see if we can learn anything else that might help us to understand this better. Um, it, it's found in Daniel chapter 1. I want you to think about what Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar went out and conquered the world. Many nations came under the new empire of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. This is the successor to Babel. And it's interesting that it's in the same area, the same place. Uh, this physical city of Babylon was in the same place as the city of Babel. Now, Nebuchadnezzar conquered the world and globalized it. Um, he did this by military conquest. Now, modern globalists want to do the same. Uh, most of the major wars in, um, of conquest in history were about consolidating government. Even the Nazis in World War II wanted a supranational government or supranational control. Globalists today claim their goal is peace. But the opposite actually happens. They're all preparing for war. Globalists are preparing for war. You can't prepare for war and prepare for peace at the same time. But the bottom line is that globalization does not bring peace. It actually brings more war, more conflict. Because especially uh, globalists like to mix cultures. They like to bring cultures together. And there's clash of civilizations. And then once the clash is over, then they learn to live together. That's the idea behind the globalist plan for migration and, and uh, that's why you have this massive migration from various parts of the world uh, into other parts of the world. In, in Europe, for instance, um, the Muslims coming 
from Syria and other places in the Middle East uh, have almost overwhelmed uh, Germany and other parts of Europe. Um, this is all part of the globalist plan. Globalists want to consolidate all nations under one worldwide government, just like in Nimrod's time and Nebuchadnezzar's time. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of state, uh, the first of a string of kingdoms that followed one after the other. These were all globalist kingdoms, you know, Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, then Rome. But Babylon shows us also what to expect, or perhaps some additional things that we can expect to happen in the last days under the final globalization. Each of these rulers of these kingdoms wanted a global monarchy, and they achieved it in different ways. Um, and all of their methods culminate together in the last days. Okay, War, um, culture, or the mixing of culture. You know, there's just a couple of examples, but there's many different aspects of this. End-time globalization may not reach its full maturity before the second coming, but they will try. They will do their level best to create a globalization before Jesus comes that will control everyone on the planet. So we need to understand Babylon. As I said, this is the successor of um, of um, ancient Babel, and it's also the ancestor of the final spiritual Babylon at the end of time. And as is often the case, the real story is the backstory. No novel could, re could read better than this. Daniel chapter 1 gives us more principles of globalization, and I'd like to point out a few uh, points here. Let's get the big picture. Nebuchadnezzar set about to educate young people to lead the kingdoms in the Chaldean way, uh, the Babylonian way. Um, he trained them to, to think like Babylonians, like Chaldeans, and then go into their home countries and rule according to the principles that Nebuchadnezzar had taught them, like good Chaldeans. And today, curriculums, educational curriculums, have been adjusted globally in order to emphasize global responsibility as opposed to um, national responsibility. To emphasize the global village rather than one's own village. To emphasize global this and global that rather than national this and personal that. In other words, they're changing the mentality of the children who are growing up and who will lead the new world order. That's part of the strategy. It's an educational realignment of the world. So that's what's been happening in terms of the schools. But there's also a realignment in this process, a realignment of morals. A new morality has arisen. What was moral in the past is just, no, or rather what was immoral in the past, is just normal now. That which was once wrong is now acceptable. In other words, this new morality breeds a tolerance towards lifestyle, especially to be accepting and appreciating of even the perverse, such as secular, uh, or it's kind of a secular ecumenism. One time I was in Brazil, and after preaching a sermon on globalization, three young ladies came to me, and they said, Pastor Mayer, they said, we are training in university to be primary school teachers, and we have learned about globalization. We have seen that our syllabus materials and the things they're teaching us to train the young people are all about globalization, responsibility to the global village rather than to our nation or responsibility or national responsibility. And then one time I was also in Australia and I preached a similar sermon. 
Afterwards, a man came up to me, a middle-aged man, and he said, I'm a teacher in the high school here in this part of Australia. And he said, in our syllabus, they actually say that the cities are the control towers of the New World Order. I thought, my, that's interesting. Here we are already seeing through the educational process a change in the mentality of these teachers and the young people. So Daniel chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 tell us what happened in Babylon. And I want you to notice the parallels to what's happening today. Daniel chapter 1 verse 3 says, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. All right, let's go back and break this down. The Bible is telling us that um, Nebuchadnezzar wanted these Jewish boys, to, or one of the um, Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring in these Jewish boys who were princes, the ones who were the children of the king. Um, but this is not just isolated to the Israelites. This is a principle that Nebuchadnezzar implemented everywhere. All the nations took the best young people, bring them into Babylon, teach them, and send them back home. We don't learn about that in the Bible because the Bible's talking about God's church in Babylon. You know, the, how God's church and how God's people related to Babylon. But in the history books, we can read what happened uh, with the other nations and the other captives that were brought to Babylon. But there was something special about God's people. There always has been, and there always will be. God uses them to bring testimony of himself, of his character, of his love, and of his salvation to all men and women. And so God uses faithful men and women who have committed themselves and are loyal to God. He uses them to bring the attention of the whole world to God's law, God's character. That's very, very important to understand. So Nebuchadnezzar brings these men into uh, training in Babylon. Now I want you to notice what else these, these young men needed to know. They needed to understand science. God's people need to understand science. Because often it is a bit of scientific knowledge that can help you witness to people in ways that you would not otherwise be able to do. For instance, people who need help with their health, but they don't know it. If you can invite them to understand something about science as it relates to health, the body's health, you can change their lives and help them get better health and live longer. Very important. Scientific understanding, credible scientific understanding, is very useful as a witnessing tool. But um, in this verse, we also see that they had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. What is the tongue? What is that talking about? It's talking about language. Language is represented in Scripture by the tongue. And so when it says they had to learn the tongue of the Chaldeans, they're learning the language of the Chaldeans. And by the way, that was not an easy language. That was a language that was difficult to learn. But yet these men were up to the challenge. So they had to be able to learn languages. But not only were they to learn the language, it says they might teach them the learning of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans were the most sophisticated nation of the times. They had educational principles and Nebuchadnezzar believed in education. Nebuchadnezzar was, was dedicated to educating young people. 
And of course that was a good thing in many ways, in other ways it wasn't. Just like today, education is useful if it's used in the right way. But Nebuchadnezzar wanted to teach these young men not only to understand like the Chaldeans, but to act like the Chaldeans. And part of this is, um, is reflected in the way he treated them. For instance, he gave them new names. Um, notice verse 6 and 7. Now among these, among who? Among the Hebrews that were taken into captivity. So there were other Hebrews besides Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. There were other Hebrews. I think that's very important to understand because that comes in later uh, as we go through the story. But they were given unto names, uh, unto, they were given unto them new names. It says in verse 7, Unto whom the, the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. These are names of their gods, you see. And uh, these men uh, were to begin to act like Babylonians because they had Babylonian names. That was one of the ways that, that the government tried to reorient the thinking of these young people. And governments today are trying to reorient the thinking of young people today through the educational process. They use rules and policies like the Common Core Curriculum, which is known throughout the world as a, a globalist curriculum for education in schools. But like in Babylon, they used education to re design the thinking processes of young people. Now, not only did he give them new names, um, it, it's important to point out that giving them a new name meant that he was also trying to change or manipulate their character. Because name in the scriptures, names that are given to young people, that are given to children, whatever, these names represent their character and often they lived out the principles of their name or their character in their lives. So Nebuchadnezzar was trying to change their names not just to give them um, some underlying foundation but also to affect the way they acted, their character. But these men were not going to be changed very easily, not these four. The other Hebrews, they compromised. Their characters were moldable, but not Daniel. Daniel's character was already set. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego joined him, and they set their characters. The Bible says in verse 8 that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. The other Hebrews, <laughs> well, they must have imagined. What's going to happen if we don't eat the king's meat? Hmm. Then he will... He won't advance us. Or maybe he'll even kill us. You know, after all, life is worth hardly anything in those days. So if we compromise, if we go along with this, we'll get farther along. <laughs> Who got farther along in the end? It was Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because of their faithfulness to God. If globalists tell you what to do, even if they tell you what to do, they cannot change your faith unless, of course, you let them. Daniel was given a new name, he was, a give, he was given a new education, but he was not willing to change his character, nor his practices, nor his purpose to keep himself pure before the God of heaven, even in wicked, sinful Babylon. Now it's very interesting because the other Hebrews didn't do this, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, purposed in their hearts that they would not defile themselves. You see, there's a principle of conscience, which is the same thing as individual sovereignty. If you 
have your individual sovereignty intact, that means that your conscience is active and that you will do the things which God tells you to do that the Holy Spirit teaches your conscience. And you won't compromise your principles, even if there's laws of the land that penalize you if you do not. It's the principle of conscience, and that is the most valuable things, my f thing, my friends. You must have a conscience. If you don't have a conscience, then you're going to be tossed around by every wind of doctrine, every, every temptation, every uh, indulgence that comes along. Conscience is the most important thing to guide you. It is the rudder that guides you through life. It's an honor, my friends, to be particular and peculiar. It's an honor to retain your faith in the new world order because that's exactly what God would have you do. And when you honor God, He will honor you just as He honored Daniel. Now, there was no conflict, really, with the other pagan nations that Nebuchadnezzar conquered. So the focus eventually came upon God's people. And the same thing at the end of time. The Bible tells us that there will be great darkness upon the earth. And those who are not part of the light will be part of the darkness. And it's no difficulty, no matter what national background you may have, no matter what language you use, no matter what your cultural experience may have been, it's easy to blend into the darkness. Just like it was easy for those Hebrews to blend into Babylon. But friends, when you set your heart and you purpose in your heart to do nothing that will defile yourself before God, or before man for that matter, God will place you in His light. And when you are part of the light, you can't be part of the darkness. And there's such a contrast that people see the difference. And that's what makes a huge difference when you think about what is going to happen in the last days. God's people will stand out perhaps like a sore thumb, as we say in the English language sometimes. But really, they are a shining light. They are a shining example of God's power and His love to bring about His transforming grace in their lives. And the Jews were quite different from the Babylonians. The Jews were very distinct. They were... Um, uh, they were so different, at least these, these four Hebrews in Babylon. They were so distinct that, well, the Babylonians could see it. And the other Hebrews could see it. These four Hebrews were a testimony to the other Hebrews that were there in Babylon. But their faith clashed with Babylon. Their culture, their heavenly culture clashed with Babylon. Friends, does your faith clash with modern culture? I hope so, because modern culture is getting dark. And if you are in Christ, you are part of the light. And God needs you as part of the light. So friends, don't turn away from the light and join the darkness. You know, many young people grow up in the church, but they've joined the darkness. They've never found their footing. They're like those Hebrews most of the Hebrews that were taken into Babylon. They're not like the four, Daniel and his friends. Daniel and his friends decided not to compromise with idolatry. And when God's people are in Babylon and under the control of Babylon, they must take special care that they partake not of her sins. Revelation 18, verse 4. They also live by strict temperance. If you're going to live successfully, in a globalized world, in the last days, you must live with strict temperance. Think about that. And I'm not just talking about not drinking alcohol and, and uh, not taking illicit drugs. I'm talking about living strictly with your diet, with the way you dress, with the way you uh, conduct yourself and uh, recreation and, and all the areas of lifestyle, these are all going to have a part to play in the temperance aspect of your life. And it's going to be a testimony to those around you. 
And though providence may say, kill and eat, conscience says, not so, Lord, that nothing common or unclean can come into my mouth. You may remember about uh, how Peter was given the vision. And um, it was not about eating food. It was not about eating the flesh that was, to, that was coming down on that sheet. It was about associating with those not of our faith and how to win them and how to reach them. Um, Daniel and his friends were jealous over themselves. They, th they thought that those things which were not sinful in themselves should not be partaken of in the Babylonian court because it would lead them to sin. When something will undermine your loyalty to God or gradually soften your loyalty to God, well, it leads you ultimately into sin. And Daniel recognized that even though it may not be wrong to eat meat, after all, God had given meat at, after the flood, it may not be wrong to eat these things as they were by themselves, but these things had been offered to idols. And by eating them, they would send a wrong testimony to the people of Nebuchadnezzar, to the people of the Chaldeans, that they were uniting with them in their religious rituals. So they were jealous over themselves. They, they thought, they understood that if they, if they ate those things, it would lead them deeper into the sins of Babylon, into the lifestyle of Babylon. They knew that appetite would lead them to other things, especially lead them into sin. They knew that if they indulged their appetite and ate the king's dainties, they would develop a love of the pleasures of Babylon and therefore seek to have more of them. I want you to note this. People often justify their appetites on the basis that eating flesh is not sin. But that's not all there is to it. Just because it's not sin doesn't mean that you should indulge yourself or you'll end up in sin through it. Will God's people have to make the same decision today? I believe so. If you expect to live successfully and pass through the time of trouble, navigate the difficult and unique circumstances that are coming upon the world, you're going to have to make a similar decision. We all must make it that kind of decision. Are we going to defile ourselves with the king's meat? Whatever it may be, whether it's McDonald's or Kentucky Fried or any other fast food chain out there. What are we going to do? How are we going to live? Nebuchadnezzar also wanted these, Cal uh, these, Bab um, these Hebrews to act like Chaldeans. Uh, they were to become molded and to be good Babylonian leaders. <laughs> the other Hebrews, as I shared with you before, rationalized their compromises. Well, just for now, we'll change later when we're not under close scrutiny. Um, or maybe we'll be executed. Well, what witness will we have then? Well, it's not so bad. The nutrition is it's, it's okay, it's the same. But how many of God's people make excuses for their lifestyle their habits and their indulgences. You know, oh, we, we only do this once in a while. <laughs> you know, rarely. But, but today we'll have a little. You know, often people f try to minimize or they try to justify the things that they know they should not be doing. Nebuchadnezzar educated these young men in Chaldean schools. Now, these are the most sophisticated and advanced schools of the times. Nebuchadnezzar, as I said, valued education very highly, and he wanted intelligent rulers. And the Bible uh, talks about God's church. You know, as I said, the history books give us the rest. But young people were brought in from every nation. Notice verse 3 once again. Come back to verse 3. These young people were given privileged status, all of them. And in the last days, God designs that his own people 
will also have privileged status. Some of us will stand before kings and rulers and give testimony of our faith. Also, there was to be no blemish. We read in verse 3, that, or rather verse 4, that he wanted children in whom was no blemish. Representatives of God's people must be pure and not be blemished in their character. Otherwise, God's Holy Spirit can't be poured out on them in the latter rain. God needs representatives in these last days who will be like Him in character, whose, whose um, character will be like that of Christ. There's no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, it says in Ephesians 5, verse 27. And if you come over to Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, it says, Then there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman, or a church, clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, <clears throat> and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. So this is a church, a pure church. This is a lovely church, a church that is a pure woman, and God wants church members who are pure. Otherwise, He can't use them. Pure hearts and clean hands is what God expects of His people. They are to live right, to act right, and to speak right. The Holy Spirit goes with them. And like Esther during the time of the Medes and the Persians, they are preferred to the best place in history, just as she was preferred to the best place in the house of women. Well, that's the way Daniel was. He was pure and undefiled. And God gave him the most advanced light and knowledge of the times, among, along with mature understanding. He is our type. And if we expect to navigate the final globalization, the final new world order, we must also have the mind of Daniel towards the word and the law of God. Daniel, it says, was well favored. Come back to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. It says that these men were well favored. That means they were attractive. God's last church is attractive to those who seek it. They were to be skillful in all wisdom. You see, there's a spiritual preparation and a discernment that is needed, and this is very great in the eyes of God. And God's people in the last days must also have this same spiritual perception and discernment. Notice that they were also to be cunning in knowledge. The Bible in verse 4 tells us that these men had knowledge that was intelligent. Their minds understood the difficulties of science. Um, they also understood riddles and uh, puzzles uh, for which the Babylonians were well known. Um, and God used Daniel to connect these scientific and mathematical ideas with the true God. The secular world doesn't acknowledge God. But Babylon was a very scientific society and very sophisticated society. So when Daniel was given the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans, this is their education and their language. Daniel and his friends show us that, that God is a God of science. And he was there to show Babylon that God was a God of science. And that their science was faulty compared to the science that God would reveal. Science must be subject to revelation. If science is not subject to revelation, then science wanders about in all manner of theories, perhaps many of which, certainly many of which, are of little or of any significant relevance. Um, you can see this as you look at science today. Many theories and ideas are postulated, but they can't be proven. They can only be disproven. It's interesting. The scientific theory is very, uh, very limited in what it can accomplish. But revelation is clear. Revelation says thus and such is such and such. And sure enough, that's the way it is. But most scientists don't want to believe God. They want to figure things out on their own. They don't want to accept God's 
definition of things. So they make many, many, many mistakes. Daniel and his friends represent those who will live through the time of trouble and those who will even suffer the death penalty, as you will see as we study further. Now notice verses 5 and 6. It says, The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Friends, globalists are interested in food. <laughs> Did you know that? Ne Nebuchadnezzar was a globalist, and so he made sure that the food was right, at least according to his view. Globalists are interested in food. They want to make sure that everybody has food. Food security is a very important issue in these last days with, under the new globalization. But also they want to control what you eat. And there are some organizations out there um, that produce food that's controlled in every way. Genetically modified, it's... Um, it's uh, organized to resist certain things and uh, ultimately, well, ultimately undermines the physiological principles of the body that God has made. But in those days, in, the ne in Nebuchadnezzar's days, it was potentially deadly to refuse to eat the king's food. And without uh, special permission, Daniel and his friends would have perished. So they approached uh, Melzer, king, uh, the, um, the prince of the eunuchs, and uh, asked for a special dispensation. But let me ask you this. Will there be food controls in the last days? Yeah, there will be food controls. Probably, or especially with drought and shortages, there will be limitations. We've seen this before. We've seen this in the uh, the time of World War II. But the Bible also predicts that there will be fruit, food shortages in the last days. Just study the life of Elijah. You know, there was a great drought in Elijah's time, but God provided for his people. How did God provide for his people? How did he provide for Elijah? God provided food with the ravens for Elijah out there at the brook Cherith. But how else did God provide food for his people? He had the uh, sons of the prophets or the schools, of the, 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 the graduates of the schools of the prophets who were the sons of the prophets. They were hidden by Obadiah in a cave. And Obadiah fed them with food and water, probably from Jezebel's pantry. <laughs> but nevertheless, there is a famine predicted for the last days by the life of Elijah and by the experience of these men uh, who are types of our own times. Also in the time of Joseph, there was a great famine. And God provided not only for, not, not only for um, Jacob and his whole family, but he also provided for all of Egypt. All of Egypt survived the famine because of the prophet Joseph, if I might put it that way. So God predicts it in the last days there's going to be food shortages, which means there's going to be food controls. And if you live in the city, your food will be controlled. If you live in the country, your food will be more liberal, because you can grow your own. <laughs> you can grow your own apples. You can grow your own oranges, perhaps, in some places. You can grow your own veggie gardens. All these things will be a benefit to God's people. And when other people are starving, they're going to eat like kings and queens. Well, not like modern kings and queens anyway, because usually they're eating things that will destroy the health of the body. But uh, normally, a plant-based diet will strengthen the body. Well, anyway, among these young people was Daniel and his three friends. The other Hebrews rationalized things away. But Daniel first talked to the prince of the eunuchs when he had this problem with food. Daniel chapter 1 is about a crisis, a crisis of lifestyle for those who, live, who are living through the last days. We need to understand that because Daniel teaches us, Daniel chapter 1 teaches us that there is coming a, 
a crisis. And each of us must make a decision ahead of time what we're going to do when the crisis actually comes. Are you going to live by the principles that most people live by? Or are you going to be distinct? Are you going to live by the principles of God? Um, Daniel chapter 1 is about a crisis. Daniel had a food crisis. And this crisis led Daniel to go to the prince of the eunuchs in verse 10. And he said, uh, um, the, the prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel after he asked for a favor, he said, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should ye, he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? There's again a reference to the other Hebrews. Then shall ye m make me endanger my head to the king. Then Daniel said to Melzer, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Let's try an experiment. Let's see how we go. Just give us plant food for, a day, for ten days, and we'll see whether or not our faces look better than the other Hebrews. A simple test, but God blessed that test. And um, he didn't refuse. Notice that Daniel didn't stand in bold defiance to Nebuchadnezzar. He simply diplomatically approached the man in charge and he said, can we try an experiment? Daniel made it clear that the king was not to know about the adjustments to their diet. This was a private experiment. This was not something that was to be blasted all over the kingdom. It was not something to be made an issue of. It was just to be done privately, just to test it out. So they made a deal with Melzer, the supervisor. In verse 11 through 16 tells us the story of what happened. So in verse 16 it says, Melzer took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse or veggies or whatever uh, plant foods that were there. Verse 17, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Notice what happened. What did Daniel have? Because he purposed in his heart, and he diplomatically approached the supervisor, Daniel was given the knowledge and wisdom in dreams and visions. I think that's very, very significant. He had understanding, understanding from heaven. Heaven came down and stood by Daniel in this crisis of lifestyle. He thought what he saw and what he heard and what he tasted, all these things he watched and he was careful about what he did with them. The things he saw the things he heard, the things he ate. These are all in harmony with God's principles in his life. Also, I want you to notice that <clears throat> Babylon was a sensual environment and Daniel was concerned about his sexuality. Uh, sensuality is, was not his driving passion like it is with many today. Daniel clearly set himself apart in this area as well. Daniel also repulsed anything that was slightly impure. The contrast was so stark that it no doubt made quite an impression on all those people that were around him. How are we? Do you want that kind of experience? You'll have to make the same level of decision as Daniel made if you want to have the same kind of experience. Daniel's and his friends, Daniel and his friends went through a mini crisis. With each step, God takes us deeper, by the way, because in each chapter of Daniel, for the first three chapters, we have a deeper crisis. And God takes us deeper. He prepares us with one crisis for a larger crisis. And so what God puts you through today is preparing you for the future. And the decisions that you have to make now lay the foundation for the decisions that you'll make in the future. 
And it's just as Daniel was faithful in little things, God also gave him rulership over much. And Daniel was faithful in that rulership over much, as we see from Daniel chapter 6. Also, we want to understand that Daniel overcame the temptations of Babylon through prayer. Remember that Daniel was a man who prayed three times a day? He prayed in the morning, he prayed in the noon, and he prayed at night. And each of those three times Daniel prayed, it was his way of communing with the God of heaven so that God could stand by his side in every crisis that came along in Daniel's life. So God develops us, so to speak. He wants to make us an increasingly powerful witness. And eventually, Daniel became the prophetic voice in Babylon. He became the most credible leader of Babylon. In fact, he became the prime minister. And God used him because of his faithfulness. Do you think God will use individuals today like he used Daniel because of their faithfulness? Of course he will. I think it's very important for us to understand this. Come over to verse uh, 18. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he would bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And verse 19 says, The king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and all the astrologers that were in all his realm. I think that's very significant. You see, God plans to use you with wisdom and understanding in ways that you never thought you would ever be able to be used. God plans to use his people in the last days under the power of his Holy Spirit in the latter reign that they will be able to give witness and testimony and have credibility in the eyes of those who are willing to see it. God wants to use them uh, in a mighty way. And notice how that these young men were ten times better than even the Chaldean magic magicians and the astrologers, those worldly scientists that regarded not Daniel's God. God poured contempt on the pride of the Chaldeans by the wisdom of this man, Daniel. God honored these captives, these slaves, above the old practitioners of these mystical sciences. Nebuchadnezzar quickly found out that a little of the true divinity in these men was better than all the divination that he was used to from these Babylonian soothsayers. These men were wiser than all the Chaldeans combined, and there would have been a lot of those Chaldeans around, you know. But none of them were anywhere near as wise as Daniel and his three friends. What is the chaff to the wheat? Well, that's what those magicians and astrologers were like to Daniel. They were the chaff. Daniel was the wheat. What were the magicians to Aaron's rod in the time of um, Moses and Aaron in Egypt? There was no comparison. These men were truly far above those Chaldeans, Daniel and his three friends. Daniel had a double portion of understanding of all visions and dreams, as it were. He had the prophetic spirit, Numbers 12.6. Uh, turn with me to Numbers 12.6. Let's have a quick look here. Numbers 12, verse 6 says, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in vision and will speak unto him in a dream. So God gave Daniel vision and dream, or visions and dreams, and uh, this was a gift that he gave him so that he could minister to those people in Babylon. And friends, we need to understand why God gives us talent, why God gives us special gifts. It's so that we can use them in ministry. That's what Daniel was doing. 
1 Peter 4, 6. Turn with me to 1 Peter 4, 6. 1 Peter is at the end of the, nearly at the end of the New Testament. And verse, chapter 4, verse 6 tells us, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the, in the flesh, but live according to, the, according to God in the Spirit. In other words, uh, Daniel was given this spiritual gift, this the Spirit of God, to reveal it to others. Now, um, he was better than the magicians and the astrologers, according to Nebuchadnezzar. Um, but um, his explanations of the riddles, the dreams, and the visions were way beyond what those Chaldeans could have ever accomplished. And Nebuchadnezzar realized, as a result of all this, that he needed these men in his cabinet. He needed these men close to him so they could advise him. After all, why would he send them back to Jerusalem in order to rule like Chaldeans when they had such wisdom? He can send other lesser men back to Jerusalem if needed. So he gave them highest honors. Summa cum laude. Yes. He realized that these men deserved some recognition. And because uh, Daniel was so good and God had blessed him so much that Nebuchadnezzar made him uh, one of his closest advisors. Not just any advisor. This is a preferred counselor. When the king had a problem, he'd first go to Daniel, <laughs> often. To see the king's face was not permitted, you see. And the fact that Daniel was living in a time when, um, uh, when in Babylon, when uh, only certain people could go in to see the king, uh, to be brought into the king's palace and to stand before the king meant that he would have frequent opportunity to see the king's face. A great privilege in Babylon. A great status symbol, if I may put it that way. So, under Nebuchadnezzar, what have we learned about globalization? First of all, Nebuchadnezzar conquered by war. Globalists love war. Under globalization, war increases, even though globalization is accomplished in the name of peace. Secondly, Education is the key to success. Leaders must think like globalists. World leaders must think like globalists. In other words, they must be part of the system if they're going to be world leaders. So that's why many of the leaders that we see today, the kings of the earth, the prime ministers and the presidents and the, the rulers and monarchs, all these, they think like globalists and they plan for globalization. Um, thirdly, we see language once again. The Chaldean language is quite different from the Jewish language and from every other language for that matter. In fact, it was one of the most difficult languages of the times. And yet they used this Chaldean language to unite the world around Nebuchadnezzar's empire. But what did we also learn about the counter-movement to globalization? You see, when Babylon rises, God also brings a counter-movement. And that counter-movement is especially important to understand. Well, number one, God always has a faithful witness. And of course, he had them in Nebuchadnezzar's time, just as he did, uh, or as he has all throughout the centuries. Number two, God chooses individuals and his church to reveal himself to the globalized world. And individuals have a big part to play in that. Even when it is organized against them, God uses that hostility to their faith to witness to his glory and his power and his character. Number three, God's witnesses will be pure in every area. Their lives will, n will not be lived according to the lives of most Christians or Hebrews. In other words, God wants people who are far and above, in terms of purity, the average person living in uh, the world and, of course, also in the church. Because God needs people who will rise 
spiritually ten times higher than the rest, so to speak. God chooses individuals. Uh, oh, sorry, they, they have to be pure in every area. Verse uh, number four. They will work with discernment and discretion. Those who are faithful to God will work with discernment and discretion. They'll be careful how they handle their lives. They'll be careful how they talk. They'll be careful what they do with their time. They will have discernment and discretion. And number five, as part of God's counter movement, God will place these individuals who commit themselves to Christ and who will refuse to be defiled by anything that should come along, God will place them in positions of trust and give them wisdom and understanding to execute that trust very effectively. Those are the five points that God's counter movement to globalization embodies. And uh, we need to understand that we can each play a part in that counter movement in the last days. You are part of a counter movement. If you are faithful to Christ, by definition, you are a part of the counter movement. And God needs a counter movement in order to reveal himself to the world in the midst of this globalization, this final effort at uniting the world in a new world order. So my friends, will you be part of that counter movement? I hope so. I pray so. And I pray that I will be part of that counter movement. It means that we're going up against a massive a massive effort, a powerful global system that will crush you if you don't have Christ to stand by your side. We need Christ. We need His Spirit in our lives. And we need His understanding and His discernment, not only of the times in which we live, but of, of the prophetic principles that He wants us to reveal to those around us. So let us close and ask God's blessing that he will give us the kind of commitment, the purpose in our hearts that Daniel had to resist the temptations to indulge ourselves with the things, the dainties of this world. Would you kneel with me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for Christ who has given us a clear picture of the times in which we live and that these principles of Daniel's life will be brought into our own lives so that we may, like Daniel, live in the midst of globalization with a purity of heart and a clarity of understanding that will impress those around us that Christ lives in us. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit today. So bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.